Hello, Internet. You and I both know that it's all about the Benjamins until you learn about current and become very angry at the first U.S. scientist. Um, may, argue, arguably, arguably, the first U.S. scientist. So, uh, just as a bit of intro, if you have yourself a nice little circuit with a resistor over here and a battery over there, and everybody's going to agree on what's positive and what's negative, and everybody's going to agree about which way current is going, but there's going to be some frustration about the fact that there's not actually anything moving that way. Electrons are moving the other direction. This is disappointing. You know, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what moves in the circuit, and yeah, he has no way of telling, and so he picks one. And it just so happens that it doesn't agree with the motion of charge carriers in solids. And that's okay. I don't like to be so angry with him. This is a reasonable decision. You know, kill them all and let God sort them out, right? But I want to switch gears for just a moment and talk about the Hall effect. The Hall effect discovered by another American. How about that? A fellow from the US. And the wonderful thing about this guy, Hall, oh, he was named Hall, did I say that? It's not an effect about Halls, it's an effect discovered by Hall about something that's not really Hall-like, but it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of like a Hall. We're talking about 1879. And this fellow was a graduate student at Johns Hopkins, and he realizes something that, frankly, you should have realized even before Maxwell put all of Faraday's equations together and made some beauty there. You should have noticed this, I think, like 40 years earlier. Well, that's my claim anyway. But Hall comes along and he's like, wait, this is cool. So let's talk about what he does. Hall takes a wire. Um, it was a pink wire, naturally. And he puts a current in the wire because, well, that's what you do, right? And he has this wire. It's no ordinary wire because the wire is in a magnetic field. Yeah, Christian Orsted. Okay, so here's my external magnetic field that is permeating all of the space around the wire. Now, the wire is going to make its own field, but that's not what I'm drawing right here. I'm drawing the external field. The wire's field itself isn't going to impact it, is it? Is it? No, no, no. Okay, fine. So the current going to the right, of course, is a uh, is modeled by a positive charge that is moving to the right. That's great. There's velocity right there. And if we use our right hand rule, we've got a velocity to the right and a magnetic field that's in, and so we have a force upward on those positive charges. So we, in fact, expect that there will be positive charges accumulating up here, and uh, by consequence, there will be negative charge accumulating on the other side. We're going to get a voltage, right? We're going to get an electric potential. There may be an electric field inside of here because of that. Right. Now, that makes a lot of sense, except it doesn't happen. This is not what you see if you take a piece of copper. You can do this at home. Well, you'd need a sensitive voltmeter because this is a small potential. Let's point out that we're gonna take a voltmeter and we're going to establish that we can measure this potential like this. The problem is you do not get the voltage that I've just drawn. So let me try to do this again. We're gonna scoop this up just a little, 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 little bit. Uh, no, just a little bit. It'll be like right there. And then my hope is that we can do it right the second time. We still have a pink wire. We got that part right. And then we've got a current to the right. And we have an external magnetic field. I mean, we're doing the same experiment. We're just trying to get a model that makes more sense of what we see, because what we see is not what we predicted from our previous model. Now we're going to talk about, rather than this positive charge moving to the right, we're going to be more honest, because usually we, uh, you know, we kind of sloppy with this. We say, uh, for all intents and purposes, it is okay to say that a current to the right is positive charge carriers moving to the right. Well, guess what? It's not here today. 1879, it's no longer the case. We have a ion electron moving to the left and just look what happens if that electron is moving to the left sorry it's an electron watch see I'm labeling it negative if that electron is moving to the left and there is a magnetic field that's into the page ready ready I mean you see my left hand and I'm saying that direct oh that's gonna be an upward force we already said there was gonna be an upward force duh right same result no watch this negative charges accumulate on the top 
Oh, snap. And uh, because they're missing, positive charges accumulate on the bottom. We finally have a way to figure out what the charge carriers are in a hunk of metal. Now, it's not necessarily the same as the charge carriers in, a, in an ion soup when you're hanging out with your chemistry friends, but in this case, in a solid, the charge carriers are electrons. Now, you can get mad at Benjamin Franklin, but let's look up here at this 1879 again. Let's review for just a moment. That's 132 years after Benjamin Franklin proposed that charges be called positive and negative depending on what they do and then current comes out of that declaration, and it's 89 years after he's dead! He's been dead for 89 years and we discover this thing, and you're expecting, oh, just because it's the same country, it's supposed to have been figured out already? Stop it! That's not reasonable. Okay, so the question then, if we're looking at the actual Hall effect right here, and we have positive charges accumulating down here, when there's a current going that direction and a field into the page, of course we'd expect the opposite, polarity, uh, sorry, let me put this voltmeter. Now, we kind of have to have a dotted line right there. Uh, I don't know the right color, so we're not going to talk about that. So this voltmeter is connected right here. <clears throat> We'd expect the opposite voltage to be measured if we had the field the opposite direction. We have an electric field the opposite direction, we'll get the opposite voltage. Of course, if we have the current going that way, then the electrons are going that way. We could also flip the voltage like that. But anyway, it just works the way that you that that compels us to understand that negative charge carriers are what move in hunks of metal. So there we are, but the question is, why does this building up of charge ever stop? Wouldn't it just build up more and more charge? And the answer, of course, is that the charges here, these electrons that are all crammed together up at the top, they hate one another. And so they're developing an electric field in between. That voltage is actually causing the process to stop. So it gets to some sweet spot. Let's discuss that sweet spot for just a moment. If you have an electron that's right here, and there are two forces on it, it moves undeflected. That must be the steady state scenario, right, where you've got yourself a whole bunch bunch of electrons up here, and this electron's like, well, I kind of um, have a magnetic force upward, but I kind of have an electric force downward because I hate those guys. So let's draw that. We're going to have two forces. We're going to have, what do we say? A magnetic force. Oh, no. We have an electric force downward and a magnetic force upward. And if we've got, let's call it F sub B. If we've gotten to the point where we have um, uh, a steady state, that probably happens really quickly, and like really quickly, and we've got ourselves uh, balanced forces. When we have balanced forces, we can do equations. I like equations as much as you do, maybe more than you do. So we get a little bit of this going on, and um, we have, of course, the fun fundamental charge for our electrons, so we can say that E times E is E times V times B, and ordinarily we would cancel out the E's and we'd be left with our favorite equation for velocity selection, which just says E is velocity times magnetic field. That means that I mean, you get this out of the speed of light, and it shows up in all kinds of places. Velocity selectors for mass spectrometers. Anyway, we've already seen this. We've already discussed it. So we're going to find it efficacious not to cancel the E's here. Wow. Okay. Okay. So if we don't cancel the E's, then we're going to be able to get at that voltage. What is the voltage developed here? So it's time for me to start labeling a few more things. First of all, this is the height of the metal. Now that height is has got to be, well, it's the height across which we're measuring the voltage, and let's assume that it's constant for crying out loud. Don't make this more complicated than it needs to be on the first day. And then there's a magnetic field into the page. Sorry, I need to label that in green. This is the magnetic field into the page. And, um, what else do we want to say? Oh, we're going to talk about what this electric field is, and it's measured in volts per meter, right? So it is a voltage divided by a distance. I'm thinking V is negative ed, and we're going to be sloppy with distance here. So, I mean, with, with signs, we just need magnitudes, right? We already were sloppy with our minus sign right here. So uh, I'm going to be able to say then E times the Hall voltage divided by the thickness of the material, which we called H, is then equal to E times V times B. Oh, shoot. Well, here I am canceling out the E's anyway. All of that fun about leave the E's in. No, I don't need the E's. What I want to do is I want to solve for the Hall voltage. What is this voltage that we expect to measure? And let's just say that V Hall the hall, wow, that's sloppy, mm, sorry guys, uh, is the velocity of the charges times the magnetic field times the thickness of the material that we have. Now, this is the velocity of the charges, but charges move very complicated 
in a wire in a very complicated manner, right? They're skewing all over with each other. So this is probably the average velocity or maybe the drift velocity. It's usually referred to as the drift velocity, which is uh, the mean velocity of all the charges, considering that some of them are going really fast this way and some are going really fast this way. But there's this net very, very slow velocity that direction. You can look up how fast it is. It is very not fast. Like that's the, the problem, I guess the problem with ending with this is that all I know about drift velocity is that it's famously slow. So how can we get at that a little bit more? Um, one way that we could get at the drift velocity is we could calibrate this probe by measuring the voltage in various fields and measuring the thickness. Then we could get at the drift velocity. This enables, heck, this enables us to measure drift velocity. So you should do that in your basement when you're finished watching this video or pause right now and uh, go measure the drift velocity for some, um, some given, given what? Given, given current. No, we're not gonna pause it, that's fine. For a given current. So we're trying to get a certain current. Why don't we try to twiddle this V so that we can actually get to current, which would be a much more readily measurable thing. Then we don't have to calibrate it. We can like from first principles derive what it ought to be. Uh, 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 I have an idea. Let's talk about what current is. Well, current is current is how much charge goes through a certain section in a certain amount of time. So this is the charge on one of them multiplied by something that I'll call the number flow rate, right? I mean, is that fair? The number that are flowing in some unit of time? Yeah, obviously, because charge times number is the, um, uh, charge, <laughs> right? And then if it's a rate, then I'm dividing by time. So maybe this is super obvious, but flow rate is nice. I remember from some fluid stuff that flow rate has something or maybe everything to do with area times velocity, right? That's the cross-sectional area and that's the velocity of the fluid. And then you have to take into account how many things are moving. So there's going to be a little n right here, which is, I guess, the, the density of charge carriers, not in terms of mass, but in terms of number. So we'll call it the number density of charge carriers. And then we still get an e. I don't know why there's a dot right there. There ought to be dots everywhere or dots nowhere. I'm kind of mad at that dot for just the moment. But let's call out this n right here. n is, of course, the number Number, number of charge carriers per cubic meter, right? Okay. Yeah, I think that's why it's lowercase, right? If it were just the number, I'd probably use a capital, uh, probably use a capital letter. Um, 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 can we continue with the purple? No, it's time for a transition. Let's go to an honest black here put an equal sign right here, and I guess I just want to rearrange this N E V A because that's exactly when you're going to get on Vogue's loving. And then we need to define our wire a little more carefully because we're talking about cross-sectional area. Uh, pink. Pink would be appropriate to draw our wire again. So just for comparison's sake, I'm going to bring back the original. Bring back that original, Doc. Yeah, I got it. It's right over here. Okay, so you see this guy right here? I'm going to take this and I'm going to try to draw it a little bit more 3D-y in a more 3D-esque manner. So there's the dimension you're already used to seeing. That's H right there. We still have a current that's going to the right. Current to the right. And we still have a magnetic field that's in, but I can't draw that yet because I'm going to draw this other dimension here. This dimension might be called the width of the dang thing. That's this dimension here, W. And the magnetic field now, the magnetic field I drew in green, it's kind of going this away, which was into our page, but now it's from the surface that's here to the surface that's back behind the page a little bit. We can draw some more magnetic field vectors right there. Okay. So now we can talk about the cross-sectional area, which is just H times W. And remember, this, this has to continue, but it's really nice to have a rectangular prism. This has to continue so that we have ourselves, what, what do we have then? Oh, uh, a wire, a circuit, charge can flow. Hey, great. Um, 
Now, if n is number of free charge carriers per cubic meter, then we can, um, now, what do I want to do? Oh, I kind of just want to solve this for drift velocity. Wouldn't that be fun? Let's solve this for drift velocity. The drift velocity, then, is going to be the current divided by the free charge carriers per cubic meter times the charge times the cross-sectional area. And this is a... Um, a teacher's organization. What the heck? What just happened? Oh, it's just a reminder. Teachers party thing. I have some friends who are in that group. Oh, and um, maybe we might be, uh, we might be, you know, this, this is interesting. This helps us to find out how, wait a second. So this means if there are more free charge carriers, they're going to be going slower for a given current. Does that make sense? See if that makes sense. Lean over, talk to a friend. Does that make sense? All right, so let's take this equation right here and see what we can do in terms of actually um, doing something else with it. We wanted to go back to our original Hall effect equation. What did we have originally for V Hall? I'll put that right here so that you recall what we had for V Hall. V Hall, I don't, I don't even know where that page is. Oh, it was the drift velocity times the magnetic field times the height. And now I'm going to be plugging in all of this stuff in for drift velocity. Watch what happens. We get I times B times H divided by, wait a second, see the I? Oh, and then the, um, the NEA is down here, but A is going to partially cancel with that H right there, so we get IB over NEW, which is further fun. Are you having as much fun with this as I am having? because it just turns out that so many words and important things are happening here. Now that only happened because, oh, I've got to do that in a different color. That only happened because A is H times W. Okay, <clears throat> now remember, the voltmeter has to be connected like, like how? Like, like this. You have to, you have to have your bulk thing, and remember, what did we say was gonna be positive? I think we said that the top was gonna to be negative. Well, we can just do it. If the current's going that direction, then the electrons are going that direction. That means the top is becoming negative, top's becoming negative, and the bottom, which we can't really see, is becoming positive. So what you would do then is put a plate on the top and a plate on the bottom, and, oh wait, no, don't put a plate on it because then that would change the, um, the, the resistance of the section, you get a different current. Yuck. Anyway, just take a voltmeter and splotch it on right there with a really small contact and put another one right in the middle of the bottom plate that I can't draw <clears throat> because it's hidden. But anyway, put that up there, make those connections, measure that voltage, and these suckers can be used to measure magnetic field. All you need to do is say that the magnetic field, we're going to just solve this for magnetic field, it's going to be NEW, which are some things that you can control, except for the fundamental charge. Um, and then we're going to multiply that by V over I. Now, V over I is a funny thing to appear here because that acts kind of like a resistance. Um, whoa. Now that's interesting. Uh, you can control N. How do you control N? How do you control N? I think you get a different material. Perhaps good materials have a different number of free charge, I mean good conductors. <laughs> good material. You're gonna walk up to material and say, hey, that's a good material right there. Nonsense. A good conductor might have a different N, the free charge carriers per volume, than a poor conductor, for instance, or a poor material. Ha! I'm gonna leave you with two questions. Question one, does a better conductor provide a larger or easier to read Hall voltage? One, better conductor means VH goes up. So this would be nice, right? We want a large Hall voltage because we're probably talking on the order of microvolts, so it's gonna be a little bit hard to measure that. And the second question is, if we're using this as a magnetic field sensor, why would you not want to have an arbitrarily large I? Why not 
huge current. What I mean is, if you're using this thing to sense magnetic fields, this sucker right here, obviously the greater I is, the more sensitive it is, but what are two reasons, I need two reasons, two reasons, that you wouldn't just want to go arbitrarily high. And you cannot use as one of them that your teacher ha made you always stay below a certain current limit so nothing catches on fire. That is not a valid reason. Bye-bye!